Why? Hello and welcome everybody. Hope you guys are all having a great time. So today I wanted to go ahead and talk to you guys about nine reasons why I see a lot of Righteous Fire Chieftains complaining that their build is squishy. Now, one thing I do want to state is nothing here is going to talk about super high-end chase items like Defiance of Destiny, but more so kind of helping people fix where some of their problems lie since I myself leveled to 100 in very rippy content without using a Defiance. So with that being said, let's go ahead and jump right on into it. So number one, one of the biggest things I see is physical damage taken as X element. A lot of people don't understand how this works, and when a lot of people don't understand how something works, they typically choose to ignore it, and that's okay, but let's talk about why this is important. So, armor is kind of a really odd stat in Path of Exile. Unlike resistance and evasion and other factors, armor is kind of actually a lie. So when you open up your character sheet and you go to defense, and you see this number here, estimated physical damage reduction, this number is basically telling you your estimated physical damage reduction against a white monster in a map with no damage mods. Once you start applying like, the monster is now a rare, the monster has damage mods, the mob is maybe in a shrine or is getting buffed, the mob has a buff from the league mechanic, the mob is critting, this number basically just remove the, the five and I have 3% physical damage reduction. Not to mention there is a map mod, not a map mod, but a, a modifier that says overwhelm physical damage reduction. That means your armor is equal to zero, your physical damage reduction is equal to zero, uh, and your endurance charges are equal to zero. So essentially what physical damage taken as X element does is it takes, so say we're using a cloak of flame, which is what I would recommend, pretend this is a cloak of flame. It'll say 40% of your physical from uh, damage is taken as fire. So why the reason that's important is it's taking a, no matter if the hit is small or large, 40% of that number is now rolling against your 90% max fire resistance, which will never fluctuate under any circumstance, unless you're running maybe like minus max maps, but that's a scenario we're not really going to pull up. Um, another thing about armor, right, as we were talking about, it's just not really realistic to look at this number because again, damage fluctuation on armor is so extreme I mean, you need upwards of like 400,000 armor to effectively mitigate gigantic hits. So another advantage of converting damage to uh, elemental, do you remember how I told you that Cloak of Flame is converting like 40%? Now that the initial hit is only 60% physical, you need less armor to effectively mitigate it. So this really, really helps um, understanding how the damage intake works and how to turn these big hits into much smaller hits. So with that being said, over here in the POB notes, here are a couple of examples of where you can get it. The higher your fizz taken as, the better. So Cloak of Flame, you can get 40%. Taste of Hate, which I would say is like mandatory, you can get up to 15%. This is a flask that you can see located right here. Furthermore, you've got Corruptions on Rise of the Phoenix, you can get six to 8%. I'm using a Dawnbreaker, and for newer players, I would not recommend this. This is like a very expensive swap, but this is another potential option. Um, you've got Crafted on Helmet, so 8% physical damage taken as fire. You can see I have that there. Uh, furthermore, you've got a Watcher's Eye. I don't personally run this, but it is not a bad idea for players who are in the earlier budget who are not adorned yet. So this is another nice one. Another one is the Armor Energy Shield Mastery, which you can find located right over here. Um, if you take these three points, you can also take... 10% of physical damage from hits taken is Chaos. Chaos is not as good as Elemental because our Chaos is only 75. Do not take this unless you are basically Chaos capped though, and do not rely on your Flask for it. You, you really want to be Chaos capped for that. Okay, so number one off the list, we're good. Number two is Shock. So Shock becomes a problem in the build when we are switching from Purity of Elements to the Purity of Fire Skitterbot setup. Now, a way to alleviate shock would be rolling a flask with reduced effective shock on it. The value is pretty high, goes from like 30 to 60%, and you wanna make sure you pair that with gain charges when hit. Uh, if you look in the POB, you'll notice that that's how the flasks are set up. I can't show you an exact example because I'm on the Mage Blood setup, but basically the reasoning for gain charges when hit is monsters will hit you, you will gain those charges, and then when the charge reach, uh, reaches full on the bench here, you can actually craft, use when charges reach full. When you do this combination, the flask will start literally going off by itself. 
So let me go ahead and see. I might actually have one. Let's go ahead and see. Dump tab, flask. Do I have a... Okay, perfect. So here is actually a perfect example of one of the flasks. So I'm just going to go ahead and go to like Act 9 Blood Aqueduct. Now I'm going to just remove all of these here real fast. I think if I take this off my build bricks, but that's okay. We're just going to show an example of this right here. So see how when I take damage, the flask fills and goes off automatically? This is what you want 100% right here. This is what you want on your flasks. Now, it doesn't need to be gain three charge. You can you can get, get away with gain two charge, but this is very mandatory, and we're going to get into that a little bit later. Okay. Another way to help mitigate shock is actually using tattoos. So... In our build, we'll actually have a little bit extra intelligence. And a lot of the time, in general, in, you know, in builds, you get random affixes on your gear. So maybe you get like a 30 in roll or something. You can actually use tattoos. I think they're called the Veloco Scout. Uh, and you can put them across your int. These give 10% reduced effective shock per. I would recommend tattooing int across the board with reduced effective shock. Uh, pretty much until you, you're gated by intelligence, which will be around like 130, 120. So any extra in goes into reduced effective shock. Totally worth it. Um, there is a reason to go past 100% reduced effective shock, but just pretty much aim for 100%. We're not going to go too much into min-maxing here. <clears throat> so next up would be crit damage reduction. Now, a lot of people, when they're rolling their maps, they don't pay attention to a lot of map mods, and a lot of these questions are kind of tied together, so we'll, we'll get into those. Critical strike damage gets crazy because it amplifies all damage, right? If a physical hit crits, it does more. If a chaos hit crits, it does more, right? You get the idea. So the main way I get crit damage reduction is number one, we take the 30% crit damage reduction on the armor mastery here. Now, the reason I don't have this is I'm in a very end game expensive version. Ignore that. You will have this area located right here and you'll have the 30% reduced crit damage. Now you can pair that if you are chaos capped by coming over here and grabbing Sanctum of Thought for an extra 30% reduced crit damage, and then that allows you to also take the armor apply, sorry, the physical damage that's taken as Chaos. That gets you 60% crit damage reduction. I think that's personally enough. If you want to get more or you don't have access to doing this, you could go after Corruptions on like a body armor for reduced crit damage taken, shield for reduced crit damage taken, and I do believe you can also get reduced crit damage tattoos but I would prioritize shock effect reduction first. Okay, uh, next up would be the 90 max res setup. So I wanna go ahead and explain the 90 max res setup and understand that different players may have a different scenario here with the 90 max res. So currently this is the POB of the character at 80 to 93. And I wanna go ahead and show you the 90 max res and where it is currently coming from. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn off my purity of fire that puts us at 86. And I'm going to remove the Rise of the Phoenix. That puts us at 81. Now, where is the 81 coming from? Well, let's just go ahead and count. So, 1, 2, 3. So, that puts us from 75 to 78, right? And over here, we have 79. Here, we have 80 on Soul of Steel. And in this instance, the character has one max fire res on the body armor. Now, I personally would just get a Cloak of Flame by this point. Again, the POBs were set for the bare minimum for players who don't have access to it for SSF, etc. You'll see in the later gear sets, I recommend Cloak of Flame. So with that being said, how do we maintain this 90 max res? Let's equip our Rise of the Phoenix here, right? Which is going to now put us from 81 to 86. And then we're going to enable our Purity of Fire. Now, in this instance, I actually have one max fire res over. And the reason is, is because I have the body armor here, but I'm going to just remove that because ideally I would like a Cloak of Flame. Later on in my build, you'll notice I pivot into a Cluster Jewel. The spot I really like dropping for a Cluster Jewel would be Soul of Steel over here. The reason why is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. That's 9 points. That is an easy access to going into a Cluster Jewel. So when I drop this, you'll notice my max res goes to 89. Furthermore... If you'll notice I drop this, my max res goes to 88. The reason for this is Purity of Fire has breakpoints because we're scaling the aura effect, and when we scale the aura effect, the maximum res also goes up. So here's what you need to know. 
if you have a level 20 purity of fire, 21 doesn't matter, let's just talk about 20, then you need to take the aura effect mastery and the baby aura effect node. So in the instance here of a 21 purity of fire, well, our next step is getting a 23 purity of fire. And the way you can achieve 23 purity of fire, there are a couple of ways. So step one, let's pretend it is Vault and it is 21, as this is a big chase for most builds, you want 21 gems. So now you'll notice I am running a plus one fire scepter. On top of having a plus one fire scepter, you could also have a plus one fire amulet if you're not in the Defiance of Destiny setup. For players who have a plus two weapon, you can already skip this because your purity of fire is 23. Another option is in the gloves, you can actually craft plus one socketed of AoE gems. If you put your auras in there, they're tagged as AoE, so watch what happens when I do this. I'm just going to go ahead and take Purity of Fire and pretend it's in the gloves by hitting plus one. You'll notice I am now at 90 max res. Furthermore, when you hit the 23 breakpoint, you actually can drop this baby aura effect node. and You don't have to worry about it. If you drop the big one here, then you will lose some max res, so let's not worry about that. So let's put that back. The reason this swap is important is it allows you to go into the cluster jewel and get some more damage scaling. You are going to lose life, but at the same time you need to remember that when you're going into a cluster jewel, especially going into medium clusters, you can have flow of life which gives you a life node, and then your jewels at the end of the cluster also want to have life on them. So you can actually make a lot of the life back. Alright, next one. Gain charges when hit automated flasks. So you, we, we saw this when I was talking about number two here. Essentially, when you are in the pre-mage blood setup, you want all of your flasks to have this. This is, in my opinion, mandatory and the number one mistake people make when playing Path of Exile. When you are playing a build that has the ability to face tank, you really want to capitalize on your flask uptime. Not having your flasks up is basically like chopping off part of an ascendancy. What I mean by that is the power you get from flask defensively is really unrivaled. If you look in my RF FAQ, which I'm not going to bring up now, it talks all about flask suffixes you want. You've got really good things like reduced effective shock, reduced effective curses, bonus armor, so that's what increased armor while it's active. If you are playing in Trade League or in SSF and you've unlocked the regeneration craft, you can also have bonus regeneration. A um, lot of really good stuff on them. So automating your flasks is really big. What I recommend doing, I think it's item level 70 before you can get gain 2 charges. I could be wrong there. I know gain 3 charges is item level 80 plus, so it's best to just wait till 80 and then I just start rolling. I think it is more important to have your flasks automated and be active than to just have a suffix that's usable, but your flask is basically never active because you forget to press it, if that makes sense. But if I had to say the, the one most important affix, it's probably shock. Shock is always a very scary thing because when you are shocked, you take bonus damage from everything. This includes your own righteous fire. So getting shocked actually lowers your net recovery. So make sure you guys pay attention to that. It is unfortunately a bit more expensive this league due to the market price, but you could also just buy gain charges when hit flasks from other players. A lot of the time people try to sync up like I want armor on my granite flask i want movement speed on my quicksilver you don't have to worry about that the only thing that matters is the uptime of your flask so you'll notice a granite consumes 30 of 60 so that means i get two charges like i can press it two times whereas a sulfur flask is 40 of 60 so maybe you want something less important on the sulfur but something more important like the shock effect reduction on the granite flask or like on the ruby the ruby is even 20 of 50 which makes it even better Sorry for the information dump. Okay, next up we have guard skills and how to set them up. So in this current patch, guard skills did get a big chopping block. You cannot put guard skills on left click anymore. So most of the time you're gonna set them up on cast when damage taken. Now I don't believe the POB has a good reflection of this as I personally don't care too much about guard skills at the beginning of the stages. I typically will tap my molten shell, my steel skin, etc. But let's talk about the three and which one you should pick and why. So we have Molten Shell. We have Steel Skin. And we have Immortal Call. And we're going to set them up with Cast When Damage Taken. And sometimes, depending on how bad your MP situation is, they'll need to be life tapped. Another one to set up is Enduring Cry. 
with call to arms. Okay. When you are in the early stages of the build and you are still running determination, Molten Shell is your best bet. Why? Because it scales off your armor and it provides a bigger bubble based off that. So in determination setup, you go Molten Shell. For players who don't want to manually press it, go ahead and use a Castle and Damage Taken setup. I recommend not going past maybe like 1.5 to 2k damage. What this means is when you level up the Castle and Damage Taken, you need to take more damage before the Molten Shell activates. So stop around 1k, 1.5k, etc. I don't have the best breakpoint for you, but because we're going face as Righteous Fire, it will trigger, or trigger quite often. Once you drop Determination, it is typically better to move on to Steel Skin, because Steel Skin is a flat amount that's not scaling off our armor, and also grants immunity to bleed while it's active. Really doesn't matter because we're going to be running Relic Esh anyway, but it is something kind of nice. One thing I will talk about, though, is if you are doing any form of juicing, juicing implying you are constantly surrounded by monsters, you're doing my Harvey Beyond, Atlas, etc., I highly recommend you pivot into Immortal Call. The reason for this is Steel Skin and Molten Shell are very good in more tamed content, like, say, bossing or just regular mapping, but when you are killing thousands of monsters in a map and you are getting hit by hundreds of projectiles at the same time, a little 2000 bubble barrier is not going to protect you. What will protect you is mitigating all of the damage over a short amount of time. This is where Immortal Call comes in, because you take straight up 25% less elemental and physical. Remember, less elemental, when we convert physical to elemental, we're also mitigating that damage. Also, when you spike your Immortal Call and it actually goes off, you gain a burst set of regeneration because you're mitigating your own Righteous Fire, which means more net recovery. So this is a very good combo. Now for players who are not in my advanced setup, which is basically using like the uh, Enlighten with uh, Unbound or Awaken Unbound Ailments or Unbound Ailments on Skitterbot, you should have a few extra gem sockets. What this means is you can set up a Enduring Cry along with a Call to Arms setup. What Enduring Cry Call to Arms is gonna do is it's going to make it so your character is constantly shouting and generating, basically, um, your character is constantly shouting and generating endurance charges. The endurance charges synergize extremely well with Immortal Call because when Immortal Call essentially uh, goes off, if you have endurance charges, you get bonus mitigation. Very, very, very strong. So this is what I would recommend. The reason I'm not using any of these interactions now is because I have a Defiance of Destiny with 8.5k HP. I'm very tanky as it is. But for players who are struggling in maps, consider this setup as a defensive setup. Okay, next up we have a big one over here, and it is Map Mods, Alters, and League Mechanic. So, Map Mods, as we all know, have very dangerous mods on them. If you are new to my build and you come over to my website, I have a nice explanation of what you should avoid. So under the RF FAQ, if you just come over here and type in map, what map should I avoid? You can see what I recommend. Now this may look like a girthy list, but I promise you a lot of builds get countered by a lot of mods. I just focus and put a lot of emphasis on what will kill you, which will usually kill you on almost any build. For example, minus maximum elemental res hurts almost every build in the game. That's not like Lori of Eternal Damnation. This is very dangerous for any build, especially builds that are going melee. Less recovery is something I don't run. It completely eliminates your, your basically your regeneration. Same thing with no regeneration. Reduced effect of non-curse auras is going to lower your max res because we're using purity of fire for those breakpoints, so don't run this one either. Next up, monsters gain life as ES. This is not really a dangerous mod, but it does make monsters more tanky. Getting surrounded by monsters because they're too tanky is another way you can die on pretty much any build, right? Monsters dealing extra damage as Chaos is extremely dangerous, which I actually have to update, because it also allows them to wither on hit, which makes you take increased Chaos damage. So even if you're at res cap on Chaos, this is still a dangerous mod if you're juicing maps. Lastly, 70% chance to avoid elemental ailments. I skipped this because it guts my clear speed. And another one would be <clears throat> essentially running monsters have multiple projectiles with combinations of bonus damage. Can be scary alongside um, the league mechanic so now if we were to talk about the league mechanic on top of this 
if I were to just open a random map like this, right? We now can see monsters getting 50% crit multiplier, 50% of physical as extra lightning. These mods stack exactly, well, they stack with the map mods. So if you're already taking a character who feels weak and you're juicing your maps up without the correct defensive layers, and then on top of that, you're running scary map mods, and then you have monsters that are getting an extra bonus, this is where things get really out of hand very quickly and players kind of lack the understanding sometimes to understand where the damage is occurring. If we go one step further, if you are running Eater or Exarch Influence and you have altars on your map and you are clicking things like nearby monsters gain 100% bonus damage as fire, nearby monsters get 100% bonus damage as chaos, you are now adding another layer of difficulty on top of the difficult gameplay. Again, a lot of builds can handle this, but it's about progression, understanding when you're able to tackle the content and how tanky your character really is, right? A lot of the times you'll see content creators like myself just click a whole bunch of random stuff, but that's because we're used to it. We understand what we're dealing with, right? Okay, so that pretty that was a big one, so I do apologize for that one. The other one is minus chaos res, or sorry, chaos res in general. In the past, you could get away with a lot less chaos resistance, but now, and I will say a, a bigger importance on builds that go melee and do less damage than others should prioritize more chaos resistance because we are constantly getting hit. And because we are constantly getting hit, we want to have all of our defensive layers active and we want to make sure we're not weak against one thing specifically. Thankfully, Chieftain has a big benefit here because we can just stack fire and fire and chaos res and easily achieve chaos resistance cap, whereas other ascendancies have to also balance cold and lightning resistance. So this is something that you really do want to focus on. I would say you don't necessarily need chaos cap, but getting to like 40, 50% chaos resistance is a very, very good spot. But if you are juicing to the point where your screen is filled with monsters, you want to hit capped chaos res, in my opinion. The last one is going to be one we kind of talked about, which is basically getting surrounded, lack of damage, and standing still. Now, this last point is a bit counterintuitive because on our ascendancy, we want to stand still, but it doesn't mean you have to stand still against everything, right? So when you're getting surrounded with righteous fire builds, if you are not tanky enough or you don't understand your defensive layers, this is why I like running Frost Blink. If you are surrounded by monsters, simply reposition yourself and Frost Blink out. Unless you are very tanky, I would not recommend ever getting surrounded. One of the nice things about righteous fire builds is the actual ring of righteous fire once you have it set so it does enough damage, you should not really have to worry about a lot of monsters surrounding you. And the reason being is this ring should be killing them. When you pair this ring together with the Chieftain Ascendancy, in Akora, if one of these mobs pop, they should all pretty much explode. Now, obviously, again, in the very early stages, this will not be the case. But for people in softcore trade, you should absolutely be able to achieve this. Then you can combine this with the Ignite Proliferation, whether you're getting it on gloves or you're getting it on a Fan the Flames Cluster Jewel located like this, this adds a defensive layer by killing monsters. I know it sounds like a meme, but it's really not. When you have a giant extra circle that's doing a multi-million ignite, it kind of creates a little safety net so that if you stand there, the mobs are not gonna be able to kill you outside of, you know, dead and a dead and ranged mobs. So hopefully some of these kind of helped you guys out. Uh, remember an extra tip on the standing still, the standing still on the Chieftain Ascendancy can be as simple as I stand still for 0.5 of a second. Quick example, here's a pack of mobs. I threw a fire trap. That duration of me throwing the fire trap, I'm standing still. Maybe they're dead already. Doesn't mean you literally have to like, like walk your way like this through a map. So anyway, I hope that helped you guys out. I know it was a bit of information vomit, so I do apologize. Uh, let me know in the comments below if there's anything I missed or if you think that, you know, you'd like another video on etc. So catch you guys all later. Thanks everyone so much for watching. If you guys enjoyed the video, please feel free to like, share, and subscribe. And don't forget you can catch me streaming live every day but Sundays at twitch.tv slash pox. See you guys all tomorrow.